today the topic DE and I on the job panel and just I, I briefly went over completing the Google check-in form in the chat please make sure you do that to help us track attendance and to follow up with you with resources and the recording um, we ask that all attendees keep their audio and um, pretty much your audio um, muted um, and we will have opportunity after the facilitated panel session to um, have audience Q&A. Um, if you have a question for any of the panelists, um, we ask that you enter it um, in the chat um, and we will have um, our moderator Anita um, say the questions out loud later due to, during the audience Q&A. Um, if you do have a question specific for one of the panelists, please address who the question is for by mentioning their name. Otherwise, if it's a question that's open to all, then you can just post the question as is. Um, all right, moving along here. Um, just a quick review of the agenda. Um, we will have the employer panel taking place um, shortly until about 1240. And then after that time, we will have about 15 minutes for audience Q&A and then some closing remarks. And um, here I just wanted to kind of post the name of the panelists that we have here today along with their company, but I'm gonna have each of them introduce themselves shortly, so. So question number one, and this is for all panelists, um, if they could each please introduce themselves, name, major, job title, and company name. So I'm just going to kind of go down the line here. Um, Amanda, if you could please introduce yourself first. Yeah, absolutely. I may add just a couple more things to that list. But hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Terrazas, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am representing Texas Instruments. Um, I am a Hispanic, lesbian, cis woman from the Bay Area, but I currently live here in Dallas. Uh, my degree is actually in electrical engineering from Santa Clara University, and I started my career at TI as an engineer, uh, specifically a product marketing engineer, and, but now I work in HR, and I'm a university recruiting manager, and I support San Jose State um, University. I am also the chair of our Pride ERG. Awesome. Great introduction, Amanda. And any of the other panelists, feel free to add anything else you would like to share as part of your introduction. Thank you for that. Um, so next, I'll go over to Joshua. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, my name is Joshua Gutierrez. Um, and Amanda, thanks so much for reminding me. That's great uh, to also announce my pronouns. So my pronouns are he and him. Um, I uh, was uh, so I'm born, raised, and miseducated in Southern California. I grew up in a small town in Barstow. Uh, went, graduated from Cal State University San Bernardino in uh, 2009, uh, and since then have traveled all over the place and worked in a variety of roles. And luckily, have ended up in this position at Google, where I'm a university program specialist, where I manage our Hispanic-serving institution outreach. So that includes San Jose State. Um, really, really excited to be here with you all. I think the the key factor in in this whole conversation and and what we're going to talk about. Um, going forward is, you know, think of me as a connector and, and somebody who you can lean on when it comes to thinking about your professional development in the tech industry. Um, you have so many great folks here today to learn from. So take in as much as you can. And, and thank you so much for letting us join. Thank you, Joshua, for the great introduction. Um, and next, um, Suleika. Sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Zuleika Pena, and I am here on behalf of PwC. I've been with the firm for six years now. I started off as an intern in our external audit assurance practice and stayed on as an associate to make senior associate before moving into our campus recruiting world. And now I'm the lead San Jose State campus recruiter for PwC. Um, that to me means a lot because I'm an SJSU alum myself. I graduated with a corporate accounting and finance major. Um, I won't date myself with my grad date for you all, but it has been a while. So I'm definitely excited to, to be on this panel and hopefully share some insight that will help all of you here today. 
Awesome, thank you, Zuleika. And we did have two other panelists scheduled um, for today's um, session, which was a Margaret, Margaret Pauline from Lockheed Martin. And if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Nanika um, from Intel, I don't see either of them currently logged on, unfortunately, to our session. Not sure if they're running a bit late. Um, but just wanted to kind of share with all of you if any if any of the student participants were looking to connect um, with these two um, recruiters further, um, you can feel free to email me and we can see if, if they're willing to kind of connect offline if they're not able to attend today's session. Um, but thank you all of you who are joining us today. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to sharing my screen here. So next question here. So what does diversity and inclusion mean for your company? And this question um, I'm gonna ask of all our um, current panelists. So let's just go kind of back down the line. Um, Amanda, if you can share, what does diversity and inclusion mean for your company? Yeah, absolutely. Um, diversity and inclusion is extremely important at Texas Instruments. Um, we know that no two employees are the same and everyone's going to bring their own unique perspective. And, and also because we're a worldwide company, our employees also bring contributions from around the globe. Um, so we really do value every voice. And at TI, we encourage open discussion and sharing differences of perspectives. Um, for us, uh, we try to create an environment that unlocks everyone's full potential, respects each other, values our differences, and encourages people to put thoughts and ideas on the table. I, that's really what makes us strong. Uh, we know that all of our different diverse backgrounds at TI, I think we're well over 30,000 employees worldwide. So it's a lot, of, um, a lot of different backgrounds and perspectives, as you can imagine. But we know that that's what makes our parts more innovative and our companies stronger. And really, we just want everyone to be able to bring their whole selves to work. So fostering that environment. Awesome, thank you. So definitely encouraging um, you know, folks from all different backgrounds to bring in their perspective to the company and adding value that way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, next, I'll go over to Joshua. Awesome, yeah, thanks so much. And I mean, it's it's funny because I think we're you know we're talking about DEI, and I'm sure that all three of our answers are going to be really similar because, um, as Amanda mentioned, you know, making sure that we have really diverse perspectives is the only way we build innovative products. Um, and when we think about Google, uh, particularly, one of the things that our motto is is um, you know build for everyone. Well, it's you know, when we think about build for everyone, it's really easy to say those words out loud and say, you know, we want to build for everyone, code for everyone. Um, and we use this on campus when we're talking to students. But the reality is, is if we're not actually um, creating products with the users in mind um, and from the perspective of the users. So if we're saying build by everyone, it needs to be built from the folks from the communities that we're, we're working with and the communities that are engaging with our products. So um, when we say everyone, we're talking about you all there at San Jose State your perspectives, your ideas, your experiences. Um, and then also just thinking about like this DEI phrase in this moment, um, you know, I think this is just an opportunity for us to really capitalize on what's happening around us. Um, it's a real belief that we see in the tech industry. And I'm speaking like for, I, I really think in the tech industry right now, we have this moment. We, we're seeing, um, you know, this racial justice that is like forefront in our in our organizations and the words that they're you know that our companies are saying that our vip our vps and the different folks are, are mentioning and i think it's just this moment for folks like you who are going to come into the companies that we work in and to actually make that happen um a lot of responsibility we're doing our best to like make that work in internally but when we speak about these things that's what we mean um so yeah just wanted to, to mention that as well Thank you. And I think great point when, you know, mentioning how a lot of the times innovation is brought up by, you know, in including different perspectives. And also, I, I really like how you mentioned uh, building by everyone and possibly for everyone too, right? So great point. Um, so next, um, I'll go over to Suleika. So as Joshua mentioned, our answers will definitely cross on more places than one with a lot of our responses to this question. But I think 
when I think of PwC and just the, the big four accounting firm space and just the fact that we are a professional services industry, we continue to see such large gaps in you know, getting more females and more of our underrepresented minority groups into this space. So we really wanted to make sure that you know, as a firm, we were really not only speaking to these gaps that we're seeing, but really implementing programs and initiatives in place. And I think I'm really proud when I compare PwC to our competitors of everything that we've done to this point to really make sure that we are you know, listening to our people and also implementing the right resources and programs for our diversity students who are looking to start their career at PwC. I think it's important not only to bring in great diverse talent, but also think about, you know, what resources should be in place in order to support the growth and development for those individuals once they are hired by the firm. So I think for us, it's really important not just to attract diverse talent, but also to make sure that we are giving you everything that we can to support you on your journey. Um, I think when I think back to when I first started at the firm and just where it is now, so much has changed. And that is something that I feel really inspired by. I can tell you as a first gen female, I had more questions than answers when I was starting my career at the firm. And it's so nice to see that there's so many programs and different um, mentorship opportunities within the firm that are now helping answer those questions for a lot of the talent that we're seeing come through today. Thank you, Zuleika. And I think that's a great point of mentioning not just companies being aware of the gaps, but addressing those gaps, right? With, with providing programming that's gonna support um, the diverse talent they hire um, so that they're successful in their companies. So um, I'm gonna go on to the next question here. Question number three, can you tell us about some of the programs or employee resource groups also referred to as ERGs your organization has and how they support diverse employees? So. Amanda, can you please share with us? Absolutely. So all of our ERGs live under what we call our TI diversity network. And the leader of our network actually reports directly into our head of uh, HR. So we have, this is not just, you know, some subgroup on the side that we have just to have. This is a very important role and team um, that TI takes very seriously. And so under that um, TI diversity network, which you may also hear me refer to as TIDN, um, lives all of our ERGs. And so we've had this program in place for well over 30 years, and we've had different ERGs kind of be added to that list over time. Um, it, our pride group, for example, has actually been around for over 25 years. I think we're on year 26 or 27 now. Um, which is kind of shocking, especially since that started here in Dallas, um, you know, 25 years ago before, you know, uh, gay marriage was legal and all other kinds of things, right? Um, and we're actually in Texas up until I think a year ago, a year and a half ago, you could be fired for being gay still. So um, it's really cool that TI has had that, you know, um, in place for so many years. Um, but our our TIDN network has really helped educate our employees and bring innovative topics, you know, that matter most to the table. And this is a grassroots effort. So the ERGs are led by employees who want to help lead them. Um, we have more than 30 different initiatives that are made up of employees from various ethnic, racial, religious backgrounds. We have gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, employees with disabilities, and U.S. military veterans. Um, and every initiative is open to all TIers. So you don't have to identify within that group to participate within it. Um, and we also, as the ERGs, as individual groups, they encourage uh, employees to share ideas, to discuss maybe challenging topics that are important to that group, um, spread awareness to everyone else at TI. And that's why the um, open to all is very important. We also help provide career um, development, community involvement, uh, recognition to leadership, as well as mentoring support. That's awesome. Great to hear that there's a lot of support programs for employees and, you know, based not just on culture, but religion or how they might identify, but also that it's open to all, as you mentioned, as well. Um, and that it's, it sounds like a great opportunity to have discussions within those groups as well. 
Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, next, I'll go over to Joshua. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I, that is super wild, Amanda, to hear about everything you just mentioned about Texas and being able to be fired. Oh, close to a year ago, that's wild to me. Um, that was really, um, yeah, that's really, that's really intense. Um, but it's really cool. I was hearing you talk about the TI Diversity Network. I think that's really awesome that it's baked into a program in the company. And I think um, when I think about Google, I, I heard a lot of the same kind of concepts, you know, grassroots efforts um, built from the employees and by the employees. All of that is really similar, but I really love this TI Diversity Network idea and how that connects the dots um, to the ERGs. I think there could be a lot of opportunity there too within Google. Um, and I guess just to speak about Google's ERGs and our employee resource groups, similarly, I think we just in general, you know, we're a, in the sense of a, of a major corporate world and, and in the tech world where we are, we've been around for a while, but we're a pretty newish company in the sense that, you know, we've been around for 20 ish so years. Um, but when we're thinking about employee resource groups, I think what we're, we're focusing on is building a more diverse workforce um, and making sure that we're expanding higher oppor hiring opportunities for underrepresented groups within those employee resource groups. So they do a lot of things within the community. Um, some of the things I was hearing you say, Amanda, about like educating employees, so important. Um, making sure that we're sharing ideas, we're discussing different topics. Right now we have our Hispanic Google network. So OLA, which is what it's called, the Hispanic Opportunities for Leadership and Advocacy. We have our uh, Latinx Heritage Month, our Hispanic Heritage Month activities that are going on across the company. But in general, we have close to 15 employee resource groups and they, they are growing and there's multiple, and there's even more um, that connect more than 40,000 Googlers. Um, they're comprised of members that have been historically and contemporarily underrepresented in tech, but they're also folks who strive to be allies. And um, the way we think about them is just groups that really work to leverage um, the power of community in a variety of different ways. So when it comes to what types we have, you know, we have our disability alliance, um, we have different groups that lead community outreach activities across the globe. So like our OLA and uh, Black Google Network, um, they share career development resources with their members. Um, and in partnership with our ERGs, we're actually working to build this really strong sense of community and belonging in our work uh, workplace. So some examples include our Women of Color Summit for over 20,000 Googlers across 100 plus cities. Um, and that's also expanded across our EMEA offices, which are in Europe. Um, and one, one other thing I wanted to touch on that I think is really valuable and important is like, even my job right now, I mean, when I first started at Google, I was so active in Ola and it was a small, small group. Um, and it was because I was an intern recruiter. And at the time I saw this opportunity where I was realizing like, you know, we didn't have recruitment outreach efforts happening at our, at our Cal States and being a Cal State San Bernardino graduate, I was like, what is going on here? Now we were definitely at the Cal States like doing recruitment work, but I was noticing from our hiring that we weren't seeing as many Cal State graduates. And I always kind of questioned what was happening there. Um, and really one of the cool things we have at Google is these 20% opportunities, which is 20% of your role can go into anything that you're interested in. Um, that's going to impact the company. And one of them for me was I wanted to get into our Hispanic serving institutions, specifically our Cal States to make sure that we were recruiting great talent, knowing that, you know, I graduated there and so many folks that I knew growing up with the experience and resilience that Cal Staters have and, and how important it is to bring them to the company. Um, you know, I wanted to make that a focus. And so actually I started a 20% role where we brought Hispanic Googler and our Hispanic Googler network to HSIs across the country. And that's how my job started. So it's really cool that like the employee resource groups can really influence the work that we do in our day-to-day -day as well. So I think that's a, another valuable point about um, our ERGs, but yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, um, Josh, for sharing. And sounds like it, it becomes also an opportunity through these groups of um, focusing on particular interests that employee might have, leveraging that as you mentioned, mentioned, and also kind of professional development in a sense too, right? So, um, and, and building that community too. Um, thank you for that. And um, next, I'll go to um, Zuleika. So for us at PwC, our employee resource groups are actually known as inclusion networks. Um, and they really are expansive of, you know, multiple PwC offices. They are nationwide. I think for me, I joined the Latino Inclusion Network as soon as I got started with the firm. And that was really helpful to me. You see other folks who are, you know, 
higher up in their career, their managers, their directors, you want to ask all the questions and you want to hear from them and learn from them. So I think from just the sense of inclusion networks being something that's available to you, even as an intern, is something that I think is really beneficial. Obviously, representation matters and you want to meet folks as soon as you can who look like you and have experiences to share that are very similar to you. Those are the people who I think really made an impact when I look back on my career and a lot of my progression, I have to thank them for. Um, so for us, I think our inclusion networks really are a great resource if you're looking to just stay connected to the groups that you feel, you know, mostly relate to you or that you are maybe looking to be an ally for. Um, in terms of the different programs that we have, I do want to especially call out our Start Diversity Internship Program, which is a program that I'm really passionate about. I think it's a great program for, you know, a lot of our early ID candidates. So if you're a sophomore or a junior in a five-year program um, and you're one of these underrepresented minority groups, if you're a student with a disability or a student who's a veteran, then you qualify for our Start Diversity Internship Program. It's a great program that you get to come in. It's a paid internship. You're exploring all of our different opportunities. So I tell students, it's kind of like getting paid to learn, um, which is a great opportunity. And it also lines up a client service specific internship for your following summer in whatever group you're interested in. And from there, you know, that leads you to hopefully a full-time offer with us to come back as an associate. So again, this is really a program that I think is great. And I wish I would have been a part of when I was a student, but I was late to the game in terms of being recruited and wasn't a junior um, until I was recruited. So I was a little bit late to that one, but I feel like this is a great program if you're just looking to explore your options and also be, again, supported along the way to ultimately get you from your first internship all the way to full-time associate at PwC. So that is a very important program for us that I'm especially passionate about. Thank you, Suleika, um, sharing about the, you mentioned it was the STAR diversity program. Is that what it's? Yeah, great to hear that it basically um, assists students from, you know, going into an internship role all the way to becoming a full-time um, associate and, and helping them along that journey. Um, as we know that taking on a new role is always an adjustment, and lots of learning um, that goes on with that. And also great to hear, um, I think another good fact is to know that it might not always be titled employee resource groups, right? So we're hearing that in this case with um, PwC, it's um, inclusion groups, which is another, sounds like a really great term to use for the um, groups as well. So something for students to be aware of too, as you're kind of looking and doing that research on different companies. Um, so let's go ahead and move along to the next question here. So I know this question, we didn't have assigned to any of our um, panelists here, um, but if any of you would like to respond to this question, you kind of, some of you sort of touched up on this already. How can students connect with your mentorship programs or ERGs to learn about how they can best thrive in your organization? Sounds like Suleika, you kind of touched up on that with the STAR diversity internship. Um, just opening this question, if anyone of you would like to share on this, if not, um, it's okay, we can move on to the next question. I think I can just jump in because um, I think Zuleika highlighting that, that program is so important. Um, similarly, Google has uh, a similar program. So we have our STEP internship for first and second year students who are from underrepresented backgrounds and universities um, who are looking for that start in tech. So it's a software engineering internship. And it's a very similar, um, you know, mentorship along the way. You work in, in pairs rather than by yourself with a, um, with a Google host. And it's over the summer, 12 weeks. Um, in general, I think that internship is, is really valuable because it gets you that start in the industry, gets you that developmental um, kind of setup for, for, the, for the roles going forward. And, and specifically to Zuleika's point with the intention of eventually coming back to Google as a full-time employee. Um, similarly, we have the BOLD program. That's our non-technical internship. Um, and that's for juniors, very similar to what Zuleika was mentioning, third year students. Um, and so if you're interested in, in um, those internships, definitely check them out online. I also wanna say, Beyond that, like when we're thinking about what it looks like to, to utilize some of the Google resources, the website that I always point to students to is buildyourfuture.withgoogle.com. Um, really, really valuable website to, to go to in the sense that it has a lot of the resources that I'm sharing right now 
in terms of direct mentorship, you know, that's a little more challenging to, to connect directly to that with us. But, you know, you always have my email. Um, I'll share that after this call. But in general, that's the best way to get connected with us um, in, in, is that uh, buildyourfuture.withgoogle.com. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Josh. Um, would you mind maybe dropping that in the chat box, the, the, the link? I think that could be helpful to our students. And uh, I just put again, it in there. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Anita. Um, so, you know, we're hearing about different programs that you can all check out with some of the, these great companies here. Um, you know, with, with uh, Google, they have the step for more tech majors and then bold for the non-tech majors. So definitely those opportunities for students in different fields of interest. Um, all right, if, if no one else would like to add to this question, I'll move along here to the next one. So question um, number five, I believe this, let me take a look here, sorry. Um, question number five, what are some of the ways your organization is working to not only hire diverse talent, but to properly train and promote your diverse talent? I think often this is um, something that comes up with candidates or our students of, you know, they want to make sure that they're going to an organization that truly values them and, and is not just looking to, you know, check a box <laughs> in terms of hiring diverse talent. So, um, you know, wanting to know what does the organization do to help those um, that get hired maybe before and after to help them along their journey. Um, again, some of you kind of touched up on this. Um, Zuleika, you mentioned it as well. Um, so if you would like to add anything to this, Zuleika, to this question. Oh, I think I was muted. Um, so I will add that we do also assign you a coaching team, which was something that was helpful. And it is assigned to you even before you start as an intern. Um, once you're a full-time associate, obviously the coaching team might differ a little bit unless you want to keep the same great people that you had as part of your internship, but you are assigned a buddy who is typically an associate who just started, you know, six months ago or sooner. Um, since that's more directly related to the experience that you're probably having um, and can share a lot of the insight and answer all of your questions that you're probably looking to ask of someone. I know that was the case for me. Um, and we also do assign you, you know, your coach who's usually a manager and above and a relationship leader who is typically, you know, a director or a partner. Um, and I will say my coaching teams have been really there for me in terms of promoting me to the next level. I think one of the things that I still work on to this day is making sure that I feel ready for that next promotion. I sometimes need that push and my coaching team has really stuck with me. And, you know, sometimes you don't feel as confident or as ready. And I will say this firm does a great job at secretly training you. Obviously there's, you know, formal trainings, but I feel like in all of the work that's thrown at you along the way and all of the help that's provided, you ultimately are, you know, promoting yourself by being ready for that next level. So I feel like in terms of training, they've taught me everything that I needed to know. I've never felt, you know, like I didn't know where to go learn something if I didn't already know it or didn't have someone to ask. Um, and if you ever do that coaching team that is formally assigned to you is a great resource. If you don't know the answer, they can definitely point you in the right direction if they don't know the answer either. So I think for us, coaching and development is really set into the culture and I think really has made a difference in terms of how we continue to develop and, and promote our diverse talent. That's awesome to hear and thank you for sharing. I, I think the resource of having, it's, it's really interesting, as you mentioned about having a, a coach that um, maybe recently got hired six months ago. Um, I think that's really interesting and valuable because as a new employee, um, I mean, it wasn't that long ago for them. So they could probably both relate in that, that sense of, oh, I feel you, I had those questions just six months ago. Um, oftentimes I know for any new role I took on, there's always kind of that person you end up going to and asking questions to. Um, so it's nice to know that it, with PwC, you have a, a direct coach um, and then also a leadership coach as well. Uh, thank you for, for sharing, Zuleika. Um, next, I'll go over to Amanda for this question. So I, I'll touch on a couple of different things. So training from like a diversity perspective, as I mentioned, our ERGs offer 
um, career development, networking, mentoring support internally. Um, our group, for example, Pride, we have training around LGBTQ plus 101, transgender awareness, and the importance of pronouns. Um, and we host different sessions throughout the entire year. Um, our, at the TIDN level, um, they also will hold uh, company-wide discussions around difficult topics to foster transparency. And uh, many of the times leadership is included if not participating in it. Um, we also uh, offer trainings internally um, that you can take on your own or that would be required to take. Um, and so again, this is just spreading awareness. Uh, for example, uh, Pride, we used to have our own uh, training that we used to do called Safe Space, where we would go and talk to different business units um, about the importance of employees being able to bring their whole selves to work and um, why it's important to respect one another and not make assumptions. And that has actually turned into a company-wide training that is now an official training in our like learning portal. Um, and it tackles pride history, uh, why language matters, understanding pronouns, and fostering a safe space and how to become an ally for others. So really cool from like a diversity perspective, the uh, amount of training that we have available. Now, from a career development standpoint, um, we don't expect anybody to be an expert when they come in and work for us, you know, on day one. And uh, quite frankly, not for either a couple, like many months or years, depending on the role. So when you come into a full-time job at TI, you will be 90% of our roles, um, unless they're like external hires or, you know, you have, they're very specific ones that are not included in this, but the majority of our roles are part of a rotation program which means that if you go into digital marketing or if you go into technical sales or digital design applications, each one of those functions has their own specific training program. Um, sorry if you hear my puppy barking. Of course, she decided to wake up during the session. Um, and so, but each one of those functions has their own personalized uh, training. Um, and some of them could range anywhere from six to nine months to two years. And it is a developed um, program that has very specific uh, timelines that you would be given up front. So again, we are not throwing you out into the wolves and just expect you to perform on day one. We really invest in our new employees. Um, we want that we understand that you know you're just coming out of school and that you're going to learn the majority of what you need to learn on the job. And so we have these programs to help foster that. Um, our internships. Um, a lot of our internships lead to full-time job offers and they have, uh, again, structured programs and projects that you would be working on that you would be given visibility to upfront. You would understand what's expected of you um, and how, what a successful internship or rotational program looks like. Um, so you know that going in. So, you know, those are a lot of the trainings um, that we are offer to everyone. And it's not, the, the career development is for everyone. It's not necessarily a diversity and inclusion um, perspective. We want everyone to be successful. That's awesome. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing both. Um, I think more of like the personal training to bring employees awareness and so that there is uh, an environment that you know, fosters inclusion, um, but then also the career development um, support that's provided to all employees. Um, next for this question, I'll um, go over to um, Joshua. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I, I've heard so many great things already, and I've been taking a bunch of notes. If you see me writing, um, I feel like sometimes these, these types of sessions and panels, I end up um, learning just as much as students. So, and I think one of the things that I'm thinking about a lot while Amanda and Zuleika are talking is just imp how important it is um, when it comes to our companies, and I think especially with a company like Google, I keep mentioning this thing about like Google being a um, young-ish company. And one of the things I've come to realize, and this is going to be in some of the advice I share later, is how much people don't really know in these companies and the things that we can also teach them. So I know there's so much for us to learn as we go into these companies. But I think when I first started at Google, it was really challenging for me because I felt um, a lot of imposter syndrome. I felt a lot of like fear that, you know, I just didn't know what was going on and that I didn't have the right ideas or um, input to, to really bring to the company. And when I hear these panels and I hear these conversations, I'm, I always, I'm so lucky now at this part of my career where I'm able to say, oh my gosh, I really love, you know, 
the the coaching teams at PwC. Like that's such a great idea. And you know, hearing a little bit about Amanda, what she was speaking about um, when it comes to you know just the the functional training and the, fun the training that they have in each function and you know ways that I can speak about that within our company too in these trainings. So just really great and stuff to bring back to, to my company. Um, in terms of things that we offer, particularly at Google, um, you know, similar to what everyone here has mentioned, I think a lot of it comes from our employee resource groups in terms of being able to support our employees um, through various types of trainings. I really loved hearing about the um, transgender training 101 that you mentioned, Amanda. I think we have something similar here within our, um, our Pride ERG as well. Um, but beyond that is, you know, in terms of just thinking about the direct career piece, I think manager training is something we've invested in a lot at Google. Um, you have to really start with, with great managers and managers who understand the, the backgrounds of their employees, understand um, work styles and, and how to actually create an inclusive team. I think that's the first place that we have really spent a lot of our investment. Um, when it comes to thinking of diverse talent at the company, there's also extra support. So we have our Sage Mentorship Program, which changed my entire career. Um, it's a program for um, Googlers, who, Googlers who are L4 and below, so who are more uh, kind of new to their careers at the company or are learning on the, you know, in the company, and they actually get um, paired with somebody who is an L6 or higher. So that means somebody who's generally in the managerial director, VP level. Um, where you get connected to them so you can learn, you know, how to build those proper expectations with your manager, how to have these difficult conversations. But beyond that, they also work with your manager to ensure they're working with you properly. Um, and I think that that's a really important part. I think a lot about that with companies and DEI and specifically Google, you know, when we talk a lot about diversity efforts and our outreach efforts, one of the jobs that, that we have and this university programs team is ensuring that our company is always aware of these transitions and changes when it comes to the importance of, of the DEI space and making sure that we are on the back end ensuring that our, our processes and our interviews and all of these things are inclusive as well. So it's similar with, with our mentorship and coaching, making sure that we have mentors and coaches for employees that are not only working with the employees to make sure that they can improve in their career, but also coaching their managers and their teams to make sure that they are building inclusive cultures. Um, and then the final way, you know, not the final way, but just other things, you know, we also have mentorship and coaching programs for Googlers to, to seek and learn um, from experienced Googlers across the company. So there's, there's a lot of different um, like sponsorship programs that uh, programs that can accelerate career progression, specifically for women in technical leadership roles. And then we also have like Googler training programs with each other. So we have our Googler to Googler programs where we have 10,000 Googlers globally who dedicate a portion of their time developing their peers. So as Amanda mentioned with the Transgender 101 course, like we have a very similar course that was created by Googlers and we do these things across the board. Right now I work with an incredible colleague who just built a whole Native Plus recruitment um, training where she's actually training our entire um, recruiting team on what it looks like to engage with Native talent um, across the board and, then, and also she created a, a veteran training. So where we can learn to how to identify um, veterans and folks who are in the military, how to better read their uh, CVs and resumes. So just a few different ways to think about what we're thinking about when it comes to not only bringing diverse talent in, but making sure that we're an inclusive, um, you know, we bring that inclusive coaching piece while, while folks are here. Thank you, Josh, for sharing um, about your organization's um, supporting and training for diverse talent. I'm gonna move along to the next um, two questions a bit more quickly, just so we have uh, more time for our student Q&A. Um, again, our audience, please make sure to enter any questions you have for our great panelists in the chat. Um, so for this question, number six, what advice do you have for our diverse students on how to bring their authentic self to the workplace? I'm gonna to go to Amanda. Um, if Amanda or Zuleika, either of you want to share on this question? Zuleika, if you want to take that one, I know we are limited on time and um, I can answer the, the next one. Sure, I can take this one. Um, so I would say in terms of bringing your authentic self, my advice would be to never hold back and to really keep pushing to find your own voice. 
I think it's really easy when you're trying to, to be as authentic as possible, you kind of hold back because you see that, you know, you might not fit in or you're very different when it comes to your personality or your working style than everyone else that you're seeing. And I can tell you that sometimes when you look at people and people that are successful in an organization, you think, oh, maybe I shouldn't be as authentic. Maybe I should try and, and shift and be more like the people who are succeeding. And that ultimately will mean that I will be successful too. Um, I can tell you that I struggled with that for quite a few years until I realized I need to find my own voice and I need to help teach these people that all of us who are different definitely have you know, a spot for us on this team, even if it means that we have to adjust for those differences. Authenticity really should be the most important part of a team, even if that means that things have to change. Um, so for me, I think I finally feel in a much more comfortable space in terms of finding my own voice, especially on teams. Um, when you're in recruiting, people are really, you know, loud and, you know, have a lot of ideas. And for some of us who are a little bit more reserved and, you know, tend to be more analytical, I don't jump out with my ideas. I kind of process things first. So I'm very different than a lot of the recruiters on my own team. And again, you can shift your own self to match more of that. Or you can say, I'm going to be different and you're just going to have to get used to it and make a room um, for myself on your team. So I would encourage you to really, you know, be as authentic as possible, even if it takes some time and keep pushing to find your own voice. I think that's the most important piece of advice I could give. Thank you, Suleika. That's, that's great advice for our students and how to be their authentic selves. Um, for the last question here. Um... Oh, real quickly, Sandra, can I, oh, yeah, can I just, can I, I just want to say, uh, Zuleika, as somebody who's like me, who's very loud, <laughs> I'm the like loud person on my, I can't tell you how important it is to have folks like you on the team and people who are analytical, who are going to take the time to actually be thoughtful about all the different approaches. Cause people like me want to jump in and be like, boom, passion, inspiration, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, and it's like, you need all of these things to make a great team. So when you all are out there, you know, definitely please take that advice to heart because it is so important to remember the values and the experience and the perception or, you know, your own experiences and what you bring to the table when it comes to um, these career roles. But yeah, I just wanted to emphasize how like important that, that statement was. Oh, thank you for sharing, Josh. And I think that goes back to what you all kind of were sharing about this is why companies seek diverse talent and people with different perspectives, different working styles, because that's what makes a great team, right? Not everybody having the same ideas and everybody um, having the same work style. Um, all right, so last question here um, for Amanda. What should students be looking at aside from mission statement, ERGs, if there's a chief diversity officer, et cetera, to truly evaluate an organization's commitment to diversity and inclusion? Yeah, I mean, I think the list that you mentioned is a, is a good place to start. Um, but in addition to that, um, there I have a list of some things that I would recommend looking into. Obviously, what's prioritize what's important to you. Um, but some things that you can look into are, you know, do they participate in diversity conferences and recruiting events? For example, OSEM, Out and Equal, Nesby, SHIPS, we all the diversity groups that host their own um, recruiting. Um, or conferences, are those companies showing up, right? Um, where do they donate their money or what nonprofits do they partner with? Um, you know, how are they involved in the community? Uh, do they have awards and recognition from trusted external groups um, around diversity and inclusion? So for example, what is their HRC rating? Um, what are people saying on Glassdoor? Are they, um, do they have any awards or recognition from like women, minority or dis disability related magazines or organizations? Um, do they support movements that are important to you? For example, did they make a statement or make a donation to Black Lives Matter organizations in the wake of George Floyd's murder? Um, you know, do they support, how do they support their employees during COVID? Do they have representation on their career site and social media pages and also at the events that you see them at, right? So at those um, 
recruiting events or even at your uh, school's career fair. I know it's a little hard during uh, the virtual settings. Um, you may not see everyone's face, um, but when you know things are back in person, who's there representing them? Do they have representation across the board? Um, and then, you know, internally, and you can ask employees um, this if you're at a career fair or an info session, um, or you just have someone's ear that you can ask some questions to, you know, do they offer diversity and inclusion trainings to all employees? Um, and do they make some of that required, right? It just being available is great is one thing, but do they require that of their employees and their leadership to grow? That's an awesome, great um, list, Amanda. And I think oftentimes, you know, outside of what the ordinary that we see, right? We want to also make sure we're looking for these things as well um, in assessing a company, organization, diversity and inclusion. Thank you for that. Um, next, we're going to, well, first of all, I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing some great insights, advice, and also just more about your company and its diversity and inclusion commitment. Um, next, we're going to move on to our audience Q&A here, um, and I'm going to pass the baton over to um, Anita Manuel. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, so inspired. I'm also, like Joshua, frantically taking notes, and where I can, I'm posting some highlights in the chat, so certain links that have been mentioned or um, um, any top tips, um, we'll try to highlight there. Uh, so we have one question that did come in through the chat, and then there um, are enough of us here that if you want to unmute yourself or take yourself off camera and ask directly to one of our panelists, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, but Marie Claire, who goes by MC, um, wanted to know um, from the group, what are or were your favorite activities and events that you participated in? related to ERGs or, or that you're active in now? Like, is, are there certain events or trainings that you've been um, a part of that you really felt were impactful? I can go ahead and get us started on that question. So as I mentioned, I chair our pride group. Um, and the reason why I wanted to get into leadership on pride is um, the leadership really determines because these are grassroots um, employee initiatives, it's, uh, it really depends on the leadership of what um, visibility they have to other employees. And I felt that at the time with the current leadership that we just weren't engaging members a lot, right? We had um, leaders that had been in those roles for a long time, which is great. But as a, as a new employee to the Dallas site, I didn't know of how to get involved or you know who was in the group or what it meant to be in the group. Did we allow allies? And, so there was just a lot of unknowns. So I wanted to get into leadership to help bring that awareness to everybody um, at TI. And so some of the ways that we did that was through events. And so what we do is quarterly, we have an educational series, which we called our TI Pride Talks. Um, and that's where we have our Transgender 101, um, you know, conversations around pronouns. And we actually engage with and bring in um, support from local nonprofits to lead those. So it's not just internal, um, you know, uh, insight. It, we're actually bringing in experts to come and talk to our, our employees. And then of course we wanna build a community and have fun with one another. So we also do a, try to do a social event um, once a quarter. And so that may be, you know, just a virtual happy hour or partnering with another company's pride group. Um, my favorite, and I always like to kind of push uh, the line where I can, um, but we had a drag queen bingo, virtual bingo party um, twice. Uh, so the last two years being virtual um, during pride month. Um, so just bringing a drag queen like virtually on campus was, you know, pushing things and pushing the envelope. And it was really exciting to be able to do that. And then on the educational side, we had never really talked much about um, transgender awareness and making that just a conversation that everyone can be a part of. Um, and also just making it comfortable because we do have a lot of transgender employees that and some of them we don't know, you know, if they're disclosed that or not, and some we do. And so regardless, we want everyone to feel comfortable and, and taking any stigma that there may be, especially here in Texas, around that and just making it, you know, a normalized conversation. So um, for me, like those two events are really like my most proud of. That's 
amazing. And um, I, I want to attend your next directing thing though. So. <laughs> it's, um, fun. It, it's just fun. And I think one of the things that you, you're sharing is um, making uh, spaces that are comfortable where people can actually be human with each other and enjoy you know, each other and those conversations and have some fun together so that it, it feels like there's community building, right? So that's awesome. Um, any other questions? I don't see anything in the chat, but for those of you who are in the audience, you are welcome. Okay, Mauricio has his hand up. Please ask your question. I think you might be on mute or I can't hear you. No, sorry, I have a mic blocker. Can you guys hear oh, me there now? we go, there we go. All right, cool. All right, um, first of all, I wanna say uh, that it's really cool that um, all the things you've been talking about and I've actually seen uh, Josh like three times within like a week. So like <laughs> Google's very active and that's pretty cool. Um, but I'm currently writing a paper about um, why are Latinos so absent from the tech uh, workforce um, specifically looking at a city like San Jose, where Silicon Valley grew in this, in the backyard of a majorly Hispanic community. And yet Hispanics and the uh, black population uh, respectively are the two smallest populations within the tech community. Um, and combined, they're still the smallest population. So I was just wondering um, if your companies are, or what actions are you guys taking to try to like bridge this gap? Or do you know what's causing it? That's a million dollar question. Who wants to take it? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to just jump in on a couple of pieces. Like, first of all, Mauricio, thanks for writing this paper. And also, can you please share it with us too? Because like, as Anita mentioned, it is a million dollar question. I think the other part of it is, um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's everything that is currently taking place in the tech industry is a product of white supremacy and the systems that we've lived in for a very long time. So when we think about the tech industry and what it looks like, it is framed from, uh, you know, pieces and pieces of this for a very long time. And, and what, the way I like to always describe it is, you know, when it first started blossoming and, you know, they talk about these garages and people were creating these great industries like Google and these garages. And, but it was created with, you know, money that their parents gave them. And it was created with these colleagues that they went to Stanford or MIT or Caltech or wherever it was they were creating it together and they were just using the people that were around them and the people they knew from these schools. And I think that is like such a key factor to where we are currently at. It's not an excuse by any means. It's the actual, I think is in a big way for me, I think it's a big part of the symptom. How we solve that I think is continuing to emphasize these moments and these pieces of where we're at right now, like not letting these uh, movements die, making sure that we're actually using these opportunities to emphasize to our teams, our companies, you know, the first mover advantage, let's be, the, you know, that, that's what companies love to hear. Oh, let's be the first ones to do so and so. And when you start to see these other companies jump on these movements, if you can kind of also bring them along, you know, it's, it's, it's going to change the, the framework of how you also, um, you know, really actually bring a diverse, equitable and inclusive environment and really just capitalizing in, in, on moments that are, that are important, I think right now are, are is really important. But um, in terms of like the larger picture, I want to hear more from some of the other panelists, but I think that's when I think a lot about um, where we're at, that's, that's a big symptom. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I mean, it's, it's systemic, right? Um, we know, and, and especially talking to um, our employee representatives, um, or our employee partners at, uh, at the university, as well as you know, like the Dean of Engineering, we tend to hire a lot of engineering. So that's where we, we focus when it comes to Santa Clara. Um, and some of the biggest uh, insight that we recently started having discussions around specifically for San Jose State is the fact that the majority of the students are commuters, right? Uh, the majority of students there are not able to have um, uh, uh, experience in the industry that they're looking to get into. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they come from homes that are multi-generational, that they have, they are not just able to fully um, dedicate their entire selves to school, that, you know, they may have their job at the grocery store, at a bank, um, at Starbucks, wherever it may be, and to, to leave their job that their family is reliant on 
to take a three month internship, even though if it's paid to know what happens after that three months, right? How do I leave my bank job that I've been with since I was in high school that I know my family relies on that paycheck and to take an opportunity for three months. And I don't know if I'm going to have a full-time job after that. And on top of that, I don't know if I can get my job at the bank back. Right. Um, and so how do we, how do we try to fix that as companies? And so something that we're doing, um, and because this is, this is brought to our attention, um, one of our VPs in our Santa Clara offices, we're partnering with the School of Engineering, the, the Dean there, um, to figure out how can we offer more of a co-op, but specifically to the to students who, you know, have the right experience from an educational perspective. They may not have had the opportunity to get experience out in the field yet. Um, and that wouldn't have been able to have this experience, which then is then going to, which then will hinder them getting a full-time job once they graduate. And how do we maybe offer a longer term um, experience that has a higher rate of leading to a full-time job offer? And so that's something that we're still defining and looking at, and it will be a very small pilot group. Um, specific to some roles, but you know that is something that we're having conversations about, and that's something that has been specific to the Bay Area. And like you said, the Bay Area, you know, ha has a large population of Hispanics, but we don't see that in the biggest, you know, industry in the Bay, which is tech. <laughs> I'm sure we could go on and on about this particular, like this requires a dissertation and probably its own <laughs> session. But thank you for trying to share some of those insights in the time that we have. I can't believe it, but we're already at the end of this session time. So before everyone leaves, I do want to um, pass it back to Sandra um, for some closing um, items. And also, um, students, if one of the hardest things is now what's next for you all, like, OK, we met these great people on this panel, and now what? So. If a panelist, if you're willing to share contact information or how the students can best connect with you after this panel, please drop that in the chat and I will pass the baton over to Sandra. Thank you, Anita. And thank you to our great panelists for um, sharing some great insights again. Um, just want to highlight to you all, our participants, our attendees, that if you have any questions or seeking any career support, know that um, we are available for both virtual and in-person appointments. Um, you can ask questions through careerhelp at sjsu.edu or connect with us socially. Um, if you scan this QR code, it will take you to our um, different links and, and social media platforms. Um, and lastly, um, I do want to uh, mention to you all, we love to receive your feedback and we like to know um, you know, what's working, what you would like to see more of. Um, so if you could please complete this short survey, you could either um, scan this QR code if that's easier for you or type this bit.ly link in your um, web browser um, and you'll be entered into a raffle to win a $50 Amazon gift card if you um, complete the survey. Um, so please, we love to receive your feedback. We would like to know what, again, what programming is valuable for you all so we could bring that to you all. Um, so yeah, we'll wrap it up there and I'll leave it here on this um, um, slide just for those of you that want to scan that code or jot down that bit.ly link. Um, but once again, I um, want to thank our panelists. Um, I think this is such a, you know, a valuable conversation to have of, of how companies are, are addressing diversity and inclusion, um, the different ways. And also um, thank you to our um, attendees, our student participants for today's session. Thank you all. And we hope you all have a good rest of your day.